We're delighted to have uh, Michael. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about your organization, its objectives, and how you view the, the rise of India as a global actor, but also the uh, Indian diaspora, not only in the United States, but in the world at large, and the impact of Indian culture uh, on uh, really uh, the 21st century as we shape a different world in which India will occupy a very prominent leading position. So the floor is yours, Michael. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to share a presentation. Good, well again, on behalf of the Tata Group, uh, thank you for including me in this event. Uh, I've been asked to talk about how Indian corporates have gone global, uh, obviously, given uh, the, uh, the company I work for, much of my focus will be on the Tata Group and uh, since this is mostly a US and India audience, I will use the US as the prime geographic example of going global. Uh, to start though, I think it's helpful to give some broader uh, historical context. Uh, Indian business and trade have been on the global stage for more than a thousand years as part of ancient spice routes that extended from Europe to China. Uh, under British rule, Indian industry was subjugated to serving the British Empire. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, Indian Sikh farmers seeking greater economic opportunity than they had in the Punjab under British rule, uh, settled in California, bringing their own farming techniques uh, to the United States. Um, around the same time, uh, one second, around the same time, uh, while India was still under British rule, the Tatas started building relationships in the United States. When our founder, Jamshechi Tata, visited the World's Expo in Chicago in 1893. He then returned to the US in 1902, toured several states and even met with then President uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, the Tata Group uh, established its first official uh, presence, a small office in the US in New York City in 1945. Um, today, uh, this is a slide that kind of gives you an overview uh, the Tata U.S. family of companies and brands extends from sea to shining sea, as I like to say, uh, with more than 40,000 employees, 13 companies, and facilities across 21 states, including in Georgia, uh, relevant to this, uh, to this group. Um, and uh, the Tata group, um, uh, their globalization journey uh, started in earnest in the early 2000s, and um, from from then, uh, from then, what was a $18 billion group, we've grown and today operate in around 100 countries, employing more than 700,000 uh, people with an aggregate revenue of 113 billion um, and growing, uh, more than 60% of which comes from outside of India. So clearly um, on the global stage. Um, the Tata Group's globalization journey started in earnest in the early 2000s. Um, but before embarking on the journey of globalization, the group began by consolidating its position and branding in India and leveraging the group's strength in a united way. Spent a lot of time and effort focused in these areas that you can see on that slide, the unification of the brand, um, going from um, uh, several disparate um, 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 brand identities to one unified one. Uh, the adoption of the Tata Business Excellence model, pattern after the Malcolm Baldrige model, <clears throat> and the introduction of the Tata Code of Conduct, which all Tata companies and employees uh, sign and adhere to. And based on the confidence from this domestic uh, consolidation, we went on to undertake a combination of organic and inorganic growth across um, international markets. Um, understandably, in the existing house of brands. We have some brands linked to the Tata name as evidenced here and some which are not, including global brands we acquired since 2000 through the acquisition of companies like Tetley, Eight O'Clock Coffee, Teleglobe, Jaguar Land Rover and Cora Steel. Even today, the brand, uh, the umbrella brand Tata plays a key role in uniting these diverse set of brands through the initiative mentioned earlier even if the brand may or may not carry the Tata brand name directly. My personal journey uh, with India and Tata dates back to 1986, when my father, a US diplomat, was posted to the US Embassy in New Delhi, 
my first time setting foot on Indian soil. I spent three and a half years there, graduated high school from the American Embassy School. I can say that the experiences I had and the friends I made stayed with me ever since. Um, in fact, I visited my high school a, a few years ago and it uh, has changed quite a bit since I was a student there, I must say. And last summer, um, uh, summer 2019, um, we hosted our 30th high school graduation celebration at our house in uh, suburban DC for any classmates who could attend. Um, but as a high school kid in India, my understanding of and exposure to Tata was limited to the many trucks and buses that carry the Tata logo on their front grates. Uh, one, uh, one such uh, example is here on the slide. Um, little did I know, or could I even imagine what my journey with, uh, with Tata would, uh, would, uh, would become. Um, uh, the role Tata has played in my future life actually uh, predates my birth. Um, my father-in-law came to the U.S. from India in the 1960s on a Tata scholarship to get his graduate degree. Uh, later meeting and marrying my now mother-in-law. Uh, if Tata had not provided a scholarship, I never would have met the woman who had become my wife in, in high school, uh, and we would not have had the two lovely daughters that we have today, and almost certainly I would not be the chief representative for the Tata group in North America. Needless to say, it is a point of pride, especially with my wife's uh, Indian side of the family. Um, Pre-pandemic, I visited several uh, U.S. colleges and universities as we rolled out uh, the relatively new Tata Global Internship Program, uh, which is aims to bring students from around the world to India for several weeks at a time to intern with one of a number of Tata companies. Uh, as a side note, when we visited some schools in Boston, a colleague from Jaguar Land Rover joined us and drove us around in a test vehicle of the new Defender uh, model Land Rover, which just won Motor Trends SUV of the year. So if anyone is in the market for a new vehicle, uh, I can highly recommend that one. Uh, but on the internship, uh, this summer, of course, we pivoted to make all of that virtual and still the first, bat first batch of students uh, had a great experience as did our companies. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity, and during our visits, the interest from the students was and continues to be tremendous. In fact, um, the new year of applicants just opened up last month uh, for summer 2021 internships, and uh, those will again be virtual. We have a virtual U.S. launch just a few weeks ago with the University of Maryland hosting, but opening it up to students from around the world. Uh, this is one of the benefits of everything be virtual now, of course, uh, so I encourage you to share this opportunity with any and all current college students uh, around the world, in fact. Um, the impact Tata has on a person's life, success, and happiness is something that is much more widespread across America than many may realize. During those college visits, what was particularly interesting was that in every school we visited, there was at least one person, student, faculty, staff, that had a personal Tata story to share. Tata gave me my first job. Tata provided me with a scholarship. Tata is funding my research. My parent or relative works at a Tata company. Um, next slide. Um, Tata is part of Americans' daily lives and they may not even realize it. If they own a Jaguar or Land Rover vehicle, if they stay at a Taj hotel property in New York or San Francisco, if they drink uh, Tetley tea or eight o'clock coffee, Tata Steel is in the steel wrapper that surrounds their batteries. Tata Communications provides the fiber optic cables over which one in three internet search requests go through. The banking or marathon app they use was designed by Tata Consultancy Services. Uh, TCS uh, is the title sponsor of the New York City Marathon as well as the tech sponsor of Boston and Chicago marathons. The touch screen on their smartphone or cleaning products you use have soda ash from Tata Chemicals Mines in Wyoming. Cars, planes, and medical devices across the U.S. are designed and engineered by Tata Technologies and Tata Alexi. Also, the Taj Pier Hotel in New York and the Taj Campton Place in San Francisco are now both reopened after having been closed for a few months due to pandemic restrictions in those cities, so I encourage anyone uh, visiting uh, either New York or San Francisco to uh, to check them out. 
Um, in fact, chances are that millions of Americans are touching a Tata product or service daily. And our products and services are only part of the impact and value we bring to countries like the United States. Thousands of teachers and hundreds of thousands of students across America are benefiting um, from TCS's STEM education programs and materials. In fact, TCS has the largest private sector STEM education program in the US. Tata Technologies wanted to be part of the renaissance of Detroit and therefore relocated its US headquarters to that city's downtown last year. Our Tata Sons North America office has a longstanding partnership with First Book and has supported the distribution of half a million books over the years to students in disadvantaged schools across the country. Numerous universities and colleges are conducting innovative research alongside Tata partners and with Tata funding. In the middle of this pandemic, food banks across America are a bit better stocked due to the generosity of numerous Tata companies and employees. JLR vehicles are being used to deliver PPE to hospitals. Tata Steel's plants in Ohio and Pennsylvania donated N95 masks to healthcare workers in the midst of a shortage. Tetley and eight o'clock coffee ensure first responders have plenty of tea and coffee. At the same time, our companies are directly helping Americans, our scientists and innovators around the world and numerous companies are working to develop new, more effective and efficient means to test for COVID-19 and ultimately to find a cure, something that will benefit America, India and the world. 150 years before US companies in the business roundtable last year publicly stated they are no longer focused on delivering just shareholder value, but value to all stakeholders, the Tata's ingrained the commitment of giving back to the communities as part of our value system. We know when what continues to be true today, a truly successful enterprise can only be achieved when your communities thrive. And we have enshrined uh, that in our corporate structure where two thirds of Tata Sons, the company I work for and the holding company, is owned by public charitable trusts known as Tata Trusts. Those trusts support various social initiatives across healthcare, education, the environment, and economic op opportunity lifting up communities across India. And we have carried those values with us through the years and around the world. This value system and commitment to excellence is what has propelled the Tata Group brand to the recognitions that it has achieved in India and around the world. And that is also reflected in the longevity of many of our companies and brands as evidenced here. In fact, um, we're now at 152 years of the Tata Group um, and, uh, and continuing to grow. Um, while the Tatas may have been a pioneer of Indian corporates going global, uh, we have a lot of very welcome company now carrying the Indian flag alongside us. Mahindra recently started the first new auto manufacturing operations in Detroit, Michigan, making e-bikes and scooters, soon to include SUVs. And for the past 25 years has been making tractors in Texas with dealers across the country, including several in Georgia. In fact, the local grocery store in the town in upstate New York, where my mother-in-law lives, uses a Mahindra tractor in the winter to clear the snow from its parking lot. Oyo has hotels in approximately 250 cities and towns throughout the U.S., including in Georgia. Uh, the majority of generic medicines sold in the U.S. are made by Indian pharmaceutical companies, including Lupin, Torrent, and Dr. Reddy's. Suzlon has wind turbines uh, across 20 states, providing clean power and reducing the U.S. carbon footprint. Novellus, which has been previously mentioned, an aluminum company in Atlanta, Georgia, is owned by the Aditya Birla Group out of India. Not to mention the big IT services companies such as Infosys and Wipro who are helping US companies across sectors innovate and grow. And those are just a few examples of Indian corporates going global in the US as we know from personal experience that there are Indian brands in Latin America, Europe, Africa, Australia, and across Asia. The future is limitless when it comes to Indian companies expanding globally. I fully expect to see more Indian brands, especially in the tech, health, hospitality, and consumer sectors emerge and grow in markets across outside of India. The, these are areas in which India has already proven it can compete on the global stage. Uh, the startup ecosystem in India is booming and it serves as a great foundational market to test various models at scale. If a company can succeed in the Indian context, 
it can also almost certainly succeed and overcome obstacles in other markets around the world. The ties run deep between India and the United States. Um, today, there are more than 4 million Indian Americans. Two-way trade between the US and India is um, north of $150 billion. Indian students make up one of the largest international student populations in US colleges and universities. Indian Americans are heading some of the top companies across the US and are leaders in medicine, technology, and um, uh, more recently, government. Um, a recent um, CII, Confederation of Indian Industry survey of 155 Indian companies across 11 industries with operations in all 50 states, plus DC and Puerto Rico, found that they had a combined investment of $22 billion, a total of 125,000 US employees, $900 million invested in R&D, and another 175 million in CSR community spending. In fact, Georgia was among the top states in terms of number of companies with 22 Indian companies having a presence, employing close to 5,000 in the state and investments totaling 426 million. While there are many Indian companies and brands that have gone global, economic relationships are built on the people to people ties. As we strengthen personal connections and foster positive experiences in each other's countries, we are building a foundation for more Indian corporates to be successful in the US and the world. Thank you again for this opportunity and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Michael. That was awesome. Uh, you know, Tata Group, as we have discussed a couple of times earlier, is uh, really one of the gold standard of uh, an Indian company, a global company now going out. And the best part is that how Tata Foundation is reaching and touching all the parts of the lives. Yesterday, we had a presentation from Dr. Marshalker, and he also mentioned how Tata Group was first and foremost in coming up with dealing with COVID-19 situation in Mumbai and other areas in India. Thank you. We'll bring you back when we start the Q&A. With this, I move to uh, Mega Tata from Mumbai. Mega, hi. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ani, for this opportunity. And we were speaking earlier as well that, uh, you know, this, this topic is more about India going global, but I would like to put a different spin to it. Um, and this is really about uh, how global companies are looking at India also very seriously. And uh, my, I represent a media and entertainment uh, industry, which is one of the most, uh, is one of the fastest growing industries uh, in, in, in India for sure. Um, and relatively a new uh, industry in comparison to some of the other in industries. It's about 30 plus odd years. Uh, and I've been part of this journey of the, the industry in India since 30 years when, it, when we brought cable and satellite into India. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's important to understand the fact that while India, you know, like uh, companies like Tata who are going global, um, which is absolutely fabulous and, uh, uh, you know, uh, with a sense of pride, I say that. Um, but it's also it's also important to note that a lot of global companies uh, are looking at India very seriously. You cannot have a large international play in the world <clears throat> if uh, India and China are not part of your overall growth, uh, uh, you know, plans. So uh, in that sense, uh, India plays a very critical role. Uh, and, uh, you know, I am representing uh, Discovery, which is an American company uh, and uh, has its uh, presence across 220 plus countries uh, with over 10,000 employees around the world. And uh, in, uh, in India, uh, when it got launched uh, about, uh, I think about 25 odd years ago, um, it was just another global uh, organization trying to make its root and presence felt in the country like India. And as we know, India is a very diverse country, you know, with so many languages and, you know, there are many Indias within India. And uh, that makes it extremely uh, diverse for sure, but very complicated market to uh, make your presence felt. Um, and um, 
a lot of organizations, uh, and it's not just media uh, related, but across industries, have have obviously taken a stance of what is called more popularly known as global. That is, you you are a global company, but you have to be locally relevant uh, because it cannot be a cookie cutter approach which you bring into the country, and especially like India, which is so diverse. Um, so much like uh, you know, while India is one of the is probably the ninth largest. Um, consumer market uh, uh, for media and entertainment and has some fantastic growth opportunities. It's, uh, it's expected to grow, um, uh, you know, it's growing, uh, segments are growing at 10% and would be at around $55 billion by 2024. And uh, uh, while this year has been a bit of a challenge, but overall, that's the general expectation of growth um, in, a, in, a, in a very crowded market. And when I say crowded, it is, uh, you know, to give you a perspective, there are 800 plus channels in the country today. And with over 40 to 50 OTT players in the country today. In this environment, uh, to have a successful global brand presence, uh, which is locally relevant, is not something which can be just done uh, overnight, but it's a, it's, it takes time and it brings it has to be brought in with certain sense of relevance. Um, and to that, I want to add that, you know, a company like Discovery, while there are a lot of uh, other organizations and uh, my counterparts and peers who have had international brands which have been uh, present in India, uh, a lot of them went about creating local products and local content and local relevance in that sense. Uh, while as Discovery's DNA stood for taking the global content international. And, um, and fortunately, discovery falls into a genre which is all about um, infotainment and all about real life entertainment. It, it becomes a very language agnostic of proposition for the markets. Um, so in India, how we grew that business uh, was to create that local relevance through languaging. Now, to give you a um, like I said, it's a very it's a, it's a very diverse market with multiple languages. We identified eight key languages in the country which contribute to the largest share of television viewing audiences in this country, and we started dubbing a lot of our content locally in those markets, and that created the local relevance. So when you're looking at uh, uh, you know a tiger uh, running for his prey in a jungle it doesn't have to be in a particular language because that is that that content is language agnostic and and that too uh, became a, a very relevant point of creating that local relevance for the uh, for 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 in for a market like india as well um we so in terms of uh, so you bring in that localization that's for sure and and it's not only like i said it's not only markets it's not only uh, media and entertainment brands it's also other uh, brands whether it's a McDonald's or whether it's Google or it's Amazon or Netflix lately, um, uh, you know, all of them have are global brands which have made their relevance felt in the country by going local, um, adding languaging being a key aspect. Um, one of the key things which we also uh, believe makes um, uh, you know, making global companies more locally relevant is that it's the cross pollination of content. So it's not about just one way street of the content coming in from uh, US and uh, being, uh, you know, shown into different parts of the world, but it's also the local content which is being created, which has, has the ability to be exported into other to the US or any other part of the world. Um, a, a case in point, uh, we have a very uh, popular show in India, uh, which is called Into the Wild. It is a, it's, it's a show hosted by uh, a very famous uh, face called uh, Bear Grylls. He is, uh, I don't know how many people know about him and how many people have consumed that content, but Bear Grylls is like the, you know, Shah Rukh Khan of uh, this genre, you know, frank, frankly. So he is huge and we uh, what and we he he has a show which brings in celebrities and they take him he takes them into the wild and makes them do some crazy things. Um, what we did and to you know the the reason I'm highlighting this uh, example is because it broke all kinds of records and something nobody thought could have happened and we made it happen was bringing our Prime Minister Narendra Modi onto that show. 
And uh, when we brought uh, PM, uh, PM Modi onto that show with Bear Grylls, who went into the wild and, uh, uh, of course, didn't do as crazy things as probably Bear could have done. Uh, but that just broke all kinds of records. It, that content not only became the number one show in the country, across cut, cutting across every big genre in, in the market, including the general entertainment, sports, music, movies, you name it. But this show uh, was, was aired in 178 countries. And that to me is a huge uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, the, the, it reiterates the point that the content at the end of the day is king and how you create that content, which can be, exp you know, exported or imported is how you create that relevance and that connect with those individual markets. So in fact, that show broke records in terms of uh, it, it, it reached, it had a, uh, uh, if I recollect right, 3.6 billion impressions is what that show garnered across uh, our, our, uh, across the region. And um, in fact, um, uh, I, I'm told that, uh, you know, the, one of the biggest um, shows which happen around the world is the Super Bowl, right? And a Super, Super Bowl that year had 3.2 billion impressions and our show got 3.6 billion. So we both beat Super Bowl too. The reason I'm bringing this example into perspective is that fact that, um, you know, uh, that's, that's localization, that's globalization. You know, you're, you have a global brand like Discovery making its relevance felt in the market like India, which is so diverse. Um, but at the same time, not just stopping there, but being able to create content which has the ability to tra be transported into the other parts of the world. And then, of course, after that, we brought uh, one of the biggest uh, South Indian stars who's never been on television before, uh, who's known better known as Thalaiva, but popularly known as Rajnikan. So he came for the first time. Uh, we had Akshay Kumar, the number one Bollywood uh, star who who came on to Discovery doing the same uh, say on on the similar show, um, and this basically highlights the point that um, uh, you know going global is is one aspect, but how global companies are looking at creating that relevance in India, which is an extremely important market. Like I said, uh, growing uh, for for them to grow their business across the world. Um, the the other point I want to highlight is that. Languaging, of course, is a very, very important aspect for, for a market like India. Um, you know, we all know the diversity and the multiple connects uh, you need to make with audiences in our market. It's not like uh, y even UK or US or even LATAM for that matter. Uh, but even if you look at Asia Pacific as a region, it is so diverse because every, every country in the region is so different and India makes it, you know, it just stands out by itself. So their localization uh, becomes extremely relevant. And one of the things which we did was, uh, you know, one of the big languages, the regional languages in India is Tamil, uh, Tamil um, which is a very uh, strong market outside of the Hindi speaking uh, market in our country. And uh, Tamil, uh, you know, we, we launched uh, a, a very specialized content, curated content proposition called D Tamil, which was uh, short for Discovery Tamil, uh, which is very different to Discovery, the main network. And uh, that got us a huge uptake in that in that market, you know, that and it was really about the international content, but you curated it in a manner and you dubbed it in a manner which connected with our audiences in that market, which really make, uh, made our presence even stronger uh, in the south of India. And similarly, we launched a kids channel, which was, which is called D kids. It's a, uh, it's a very local channel. We have kids networks across the world, but in India, we launched it with two local IPs, which were takes off two big Bollywood films. One was called Singham and one is called Fukre Boys. And we created the animated kids version of it, which is called Little Singham and uh, Fukre Boys, uh, the kids version. And uh, it's, it's, it's a huge hit. You know, today, Little Singham is one of the biggest uh, IPs uh, people can relate to. Um, so all of these examples, which create, uh, you know, bring in about a sense of um, uh, realization to everybody that for, for global organizations, uh, you know, localization is extremely key, uh, but how you make that work has to be dissected 
in multiple ways to make that relevance felt in the country. And uh, in that sense, I do believe that, uh, you know, there is lots more to be yet achieved in a market like India. Uh, uh, you know, digital revolution is, is uh, India is also as part of that whole transition, which is taking place from the pay TV world to the digital world. And uh, we recently launched uh, an OTT offering in India called Discovery Plus. And again, a huge success already, even though it's just been six, seven months of its launch. And and the, the highlight of the fact is that, you know, there is an open space for genres like ours. There was a white space we saw, which we, 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 we walked into and we brought about that, uh, you know, that connect with our audience who are looking to consume our kind of content on a digital platform. So, um, and this is the kind of thinking discovery has across the markets, you know, not just India, but other parts of the world as well, where you bring in the local relevance to make that connect that, you know, it doesn't, you know, even if you're a global band, a brand, you need to have that local relevance. So um, I think to sum it up, uh, Ani, uh, it's, it's, to, it's to say that, you know, India, uh, of course, in, it's wonderful to see Indian companies going uh, global, uh, but um, uh, you cannot have a global company in its true sense if you don't have a relevant and a strong presence in a country like India. India is an integral part of any growth story. See what's happened with Disney and Disney has launched, uh, you know, Disney took bought over Star, one of the biggest networks in India. Uh, and, and today uh, Disney has a, such a strong presence in a, in, even in a market like India. So uh, no organization or no industry for that matter can look at scaling up their international operations or their global operations if you don't have India in a very, very serious way. So uh, those would be my key, key points, Ani, but happy to engage in a discussion as well. Thank you, Mughal. That's uh, awesome. You know, uh, you uh, are sharing with us the complex market India is as it is. We know that. And more complexity comes when you have to do a lot of translation, let's say that way in uh, regional languages and then the several marketing. I had a first hand of experience when I tried to launch a soft, soft drink, uh, a French soft drink being marketed from USA to Indian market. And we were in South India doing the test marketing. So it's quite challenging. We will catch up with you later in the part of the session during Q&A. Thank you. Uh, and now with this, I invite Dr. Vidod Jain, uh, Dr. Jain. Uh, you have been uh, NRI uh, resident in uh, USA for many, many years, probably more than 30 years or so. Like I've been 5 0. But I would like you to uh, please share with us your thoughts about India Goes Global. Okay, well, I'm glad I'm coming after Michael and Megha. They made my job much easier. The, both the case studies that they presented, the Tatas, in discovery, actually, that's my focus also. How Indian Indians and Indian companies have gone abroad and how foreign companies have found India of interest. So let's start. That's what I'm going to talk about. By the way, you see three pictures uh, on the cover slide. And I have some interesting stories to share with you about Mahindra and Harley Davidson. When their turn comes, And of course, I'm not going to talk about Tata Consultancy Services, even though a few years ago, I did a major case study of IT services from India. We have Michael here. So that's what I'm going to talk about, India in America. And I'm also going to take a more restricted view of India goes global, restricted to America, mostly. And focus on how India creates jobs in America. As Michael pointed out about his company, Tata's is a preeminent company in trying to create value in any community where they do business. And I think that's a key, key aspect of companies doing business abroad is to try and create a value in multiple ways in their own markets. And also, as Megha suggested, India is also a huge market for foreign multinationals. 
briefly about me. I have been in academia for 25 years. I took uh, early retirement from Maryland eight years ago. And since then, I've been traveling quite a bit. I've been a visiting professor in China four times, uh, Denmark, Finland, Poland, India, and so on. Anyway, um, I have an MBA textbook on global strategy. And I'm working on my next textbook, which will be out next early next year. Global meets digital, global strategy for digital businesses, digital strategy for global business, and so on. And uh, prior to coming to academia in 1990, I worked in industry for several years. So, uh, well, Michael took a bit of uh, my, what I was going to say about India in America. The Naturalization Act of 1790 made Asians ineligible for citizenship, though they could possibly come. By 1900, over 2006 were living in USA. They came from uh, Western Canada where they felt uh, racial issues. 75 years ago, Tata opened a permanent office in New York City, which uh, Michael mentioned. And starting around 1965, there have been three immigration waves from India to the US. I want to talk about it. 10 years ago, India, Indians became 1% of the US population. Now they're a little over 1%. In fact, there's an interesting book called The Other 1%, referring to Indians, not the richest people. Now, an Indian is on the presidential ticket to become the vice president of the United States. A 14-year-old middle school student from Texas wins the 3M Young Scientist Challenge. And what she, 14-year-old, she's developing a possible cure for COVID-19. And Indian students have been, young kids have been winning the National Spelling Bee for I think at least 10 or 15 years. I have a couple of photographs to show you. Where this might lead to in the future, the possibilities are endless. Some of these might uh, be defined by next week, actually, as Annie mentioned. This is the first Sikh Gurdwara in California in 1912. I also hunted for old pictures. And here is the 14-year-old Anika Shibrolu, who won the 3M Young Scientist Challenge Award. I hope she comes up with a cure for COVID-19. Last year, for the first time ever, there was more than one winner of the National Spelling Bee in the US. There were eight winners, and seven of them were Indian, Indian background people. I mentioned there have been three immigration waves from India to the United States. This is from that book, The Other 1%. Uh, so the first uh, wave was in the early 60s, 60s to 70s, when about 12,000 people came to the US. They were generally very well educated, doctors, engineers, and scientists. The family started coming from 80 to 94, and of course still do, about 30,000 a year relatives of those who had settled earlier in the US. This all came from the Immigration Nationality Act of 65, which gave preference to immigrants with skills and family relationships. From 95 onwards, it's the IT generation. About 100,000 a year have been coming to the US. I don't know how many of you have seen this interesting book, The $8 Man. Let me read a little bit from the back cover. In the 1960s and 70s, a wave of Indian immigrants came to North America, each with $8 in their pockets. How did they become one of the most educated, entrepreneurial, and philanthropic immigrant groups ever to assimilate? And I think I met one of these guys. He doesn't look like this anymore.
Michael showed a really beautiful uh, slide of uh, MNEs from India, multinational enterprises from India, who are going abroad. And I have a few that I have. And I mentioned uh, Mahindra I'm going to talk about. And of course, there's Hindalco, which acquired from uh, Birla Group, which acquired the novelist in Georgia. According to the Economist article recently, the country's state may be weak, but its private companies are strong. ArcelorMittal, based in Luxembourg, is the world's largest steel firm. Tata Motors, as we know, India's largest automotive manufacturer, also owns Jaguar and Land Rover. Tata Consultancy Services is one of the top 10 IT services firms in the world. Bharti Airtel, number one, a mobile phone company in India, has 400 million subscribers, including 100 million in Africa. And Mahindra and Mahindra, a farm equipment company, which also sells tractors uh, in the US. And we heard Michael's, uh, some relative, uses uh, a Mahindra tractor to remove snow. Uh, they have a 20% market share in Southern United States for their smaller tractors. This created a lot of problem for John Deere, which is the prime preeminent tractor company in the US. So in 2005, John Deere began offering a discount. This is a certificate that John Deere said, you bring your Mahindra tractor and you get $1,500 off for purchasing a John Deere tractor. This was in April, May, 2005. Of course, Mahindra and Mahindra are no slackers. They came up with an ad showing a beautiful blonde woman driving in Mahindra tractor with the line, Dear John, notice the spelling for the word dear. Dear John, I found someone new. Americans would understand this. Indians may not quite understand the background to this. The background is that uh, during the war, a lot of American men were in the war and their girlfriends or wives got fed up waiting for them. Some of them never came. She, they wrote a letter. This is a, there's also a movie by the same time. Dear John, I found someone new. Of course, dear is spelled properly in the movie title. <laughs> mangoes for motorcycles. You know, Indian mangoes were not allowed to enter the US. In 2007, the ban on the import of mangoes from the US was lifted. India allowed Harley Davidson to enter India for the opportunity to export mangoes to the United States. What a deal. So that's how Indians are driving Harleys in India. Unfortunately, we don't get uh, Indian mangoes very readily. Just this month, Harley has decided to leave India. So one of the, my focus uh, of uh, some of the work that I've done is how India creates jobs in America, not just Indian companies, but also Indian uh, engineers, scientists, and professionals and entrepreneurs. Now this chart shows the exports of goods from US to India. Uh, from 2000 to 2019, for instance last year, US exported $34.5 billion worth of goods to India. By the way, more than half of that was agricultural products. So all of these goods that are exported to India lead to job creation in the United States. In fact, uh, 
I mean, for the last 30 years I've been hearing, which I now have found out through statistics, that around $200,000 worth of exports to a country creates one job in the United States. So I have some data to show you. So these are goods. So this table shows not only goods exports, but also services exports to India. In 2019, US exported $34.41 billion of goods and $24.3 billion of services to India. And they created an estimated 300,000 jobs in America. And on this column, uh, one but last column, that shows the numbers of jobs created by export of goods and services from US to India. The numbers in black are official data from government sources, Department of Commerce sources. The last four in red are my estimates based on a, that factor of $195,000 worth of exports from US create one job in US. Now these are direct jobs. What about indirect jobs? Let's say if a company exports a machine worth $10 million, well, the machine also has a supply chain. They require parts and components and other services that are supplied to that particular company exporting machine. And those are indirect jobs supported by exports from a country to another country. So those are not included here. I think that at least 50% of these can be added as jobs created through exports to India. Not just exports, but also Indian companies imports, uh, I'm sorry, investments in the US. Now this chart shows, uh, Michael showed an case study of the Confederation of Indian Industry uh, in a similar format, and I'm going to talk about that also. Uh, this chart shows uh, how Indian companies have been investing in the US. They're either creating new enterprises, what is called greenfield investment, or mergers and acquisitions. So when a company creates a greenfield investment, they create jobs in the country where they are creating the investment. If you acquire a company, you're not creating any new jobs, generally, unless it's a failing company. And many Indian companies have been quite astute in finding companies that were going bankrupt or failing in some way. So they are also saving jobs in America, not just creating jobs and saving jobs in America. This is the CII's report, Confederation of Indian Industry. They conduct a survey every two years called Indian Roots American Soil. Um, I mean, this shows, uh, they, about, they found about 155 Indian companies and they have created a total of about 125,000 jobs in America. Of course, these are not all the companies. Let's come to immigrant entrepreneurs and professionals from India, the kinds of value that they are creating here. <clears throat> jobs created by Indian immigrant company founders and co-founders. Now, incidentally, this is a rather old data, 10 years old data from our book called How America Benefits from Economic Engagement with India that my wife and I wrote in 2010. And it would have taken me a long time to update this data, so I didn't work on it. Uh, in fact, a lot of these companies, their current employment is much, much larger than what it is now. And some of them would have been acquired or gone out of business. Akamai, for instance, I just looked up yesterday, has 7,600 employees. Bose Corporation has 17,000 employees. Uh, <clears throat> 
Sun Microsystems has 38,000 employees and so on. So these are all the new companies founded by Indians or co-founded by Indians. And there are actually dozens more. I have only a few which could fit on this page. If you ever were traveling on a freeway in the US and stopped at a roadside motel, chances are that was owned by a Patel or some other Gujarati family. I looked at uh, this, this also is from our book from 10 years ago. The Asian American Hotel Owners Association has 18,500 members as of 2009. Nine. 95% of them were Indian Americans. At that time, they owned about half of all hotels, motels in America. They employed hundreds and thousands of workers, making core economic contribution to nearly every community in the US. And not just that, they pay for utilities, they pay property taxes, they buy food and beverage, other supplies, and capital improvements. Medical practitioners. I don't know how many of you go to an Indian doctor or a practitioner of some kind. There are currently over 80,000 medical practitioners of Indian origin in America. Many of them practice in inner cities, rural areas and peripheral communities where many Americans may not want to work. And they also of course are in top hospitals, medical schools and other academic centers. If you listen to CNN, you would not have, you would have noticed Dr. Ashish Jha as a commentator about COVID. He is at the Brown University School of Public Health. The American Association of Physicians from India, I know by the way, a few of their members who are my neighbors, is the largest ethnic medical association in America. They represent the interests of 80,000 Indian medical practitioners and about 40,000 medical students in the US. I was a bit surprised at that number, 40,000 Indian medical students in America. And Indian contributing to American education, not just uh, professors and researchers, from 2000 to 2018, during the 18 years, 50 Indian Americans have donated 1.2 billion dollars to top universities in the US. Now this was only those who have contributed 1 million, at least 1 million dollars. Indra Nui's sister, Chandrika Tandon, made a 100 million dollar gift for engineering at New York University. PCS, we talked about earlier, has made the largest ever corporate gift received by Carnegie Mellon, $35 million. And there are lots of uh, business schools and engineering colleges named after Indians who have donated money there. For instance, uh, Naveen Jindal School of Management, University of Texas at Dallas, Monty Ahuja College of Business, Cleveland State University, and so on. Of course, uh, you, India goes global would not be complete unless we also see the interest India has created among foreigners, among foreign companies. And it's well known, India is a huge market for foreign companies. They are seeking talent, not just markets. There are a few of the foreign companies in India There are hundreds more. They are seeking talent, not just engineers and scientists. Here is a list of a few of the company CEOs of Indian background. Adobe, Alphabet Google, Arista Networks, Cognizant, Diageo, the British firm, Micron Technology, Microsoft, MasterCard, Nokia, the Finnish firm, 
Uh, last year, I spent uh, six weeks in winter in Finland. I was a visiting professor at one of the universities there. That's when I studied Nokia. This is the first time Nokia has hired a non-Finnish person as CEO. That also an Indian. So here are a few examples of how foreign companies think of India as a huge market. Rise Geo, which is a mobile network, has received 20,000, I'm sorry, 20 billion dollars in investment and pledges in three months this year during COVID. Investment by Alphabet, Facebook, Foxconn, and others. And I think they have been lately, I found that they had been discussing another $20 billion worth of investment from Amazon in retail in India. Perkins and Wills built the world's most expensive home in Mumbai. I know Indians can guess. This dirty looking building is <laughs> owned by one of the Ambani's, a billion dollar. Bechtel built the world's largest refinery system in Jamnagar, Gujarat. But the most interesting case for me is Igniter.com. It's a group dating service startup in New York, which was not doing well in India, well in the US, so they went to India. And New York Times headline was, Jilted in the US finds love in India. Thank you. Okay, I think we are open for questions. Yeah, great. Thank you. Awesome presentation. You know, I, I uh, really appreciate uh, the uh, the deepness of uh, this presentation. If somebody who knows uh, U.S. and India pretty well, uh, you know, as John and I were exchanging privately a chat, that uh, you know, you have really put together something which is on the dot in terms of. Uh, what we want to communicate to our audience today about India Goes Global. And with this, if you may switch off, please, your presentation, yes. sir. I will uh, uh, get into question mode now. Thank you. All right, so <clears throat> we have received several questions here. I am going to start with Mega first. Mega, are you with us? Thank you. Uh, during our PEP call, uh, last week or so, or maybe 10 days ago, you had mentioned about uh, a radiant example of one of your client or an Indian company, uh, Baiju, going to worldwide. And recently they have received big uh, funding for that. Would you please share it with us? Uh, what actually is their story? Um, I, actually, before I go there, you know, I, I just wanted to also make a comment that about Harley Davidson, I don't know whether you've heard the recent news about Hero Motors and uh, Harley having gone into a partnership and Hero Motors, Motors is actually going to manufacture Harley in India. Oh, I see. So, I didn't know that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's I just a, and, they're leaving India, but I didn't realize yeah, they were, but now he, Heroes has, uh, they, they haven't bought, but they have uh, done a JV with them where they will be manufacturing Harley and servicing Harley and, you know, technically Harley is being made in India. So that's what? another great example of uh, India going global, right? I mean, uh, right. Hero Motors is one of the biggest, uh, is the number one uh, motorcycling manufacturing company in the country and is now going to be manufacturing uh, Harley. So uh, another a fantastic example of India going global. Um, so, Ani, I am not particular. I mean, I don't have the details of Baiju's. The reason I was mentioning was, you know, I think somebody from Baiju's would be better equipped to answer. But I thought that was a good example to highlight that it's, you know, in today's world when ed tech is becoming uh, that much more relevant, uh, and especially during the lockdown, a lot of ed tech companies have seen a huge uptake in terms of consumption. Uh, across uh, sitting at home. 
and uh, kids obviously uh, are consuming a lot of uh, education online and uh, whether whether it's schooling or different uh, uh, you know opportunities uh, parents and you know indian parents definitely like to have the kids studying and and they don't want to let that time go waste so a product like byju's uh, sort of fitted that need gap and in fact byju's uh, has been in the country for a for a while now um, <clears throat> and and was doing extremely well but during the lockdown it has seen a huge uptake in their uh, consumption as well uh, <clears throat> to the extent uh, that they have got another round of uh, funding and they are launching in the us as well so that's a great example of indian company which just you know it's it's an indian startup literally you know uh, he he literally he was a teacher himself by jews and has uh, used to teach and realized that he had the Uh, he had the potential to create this platform which can uh, simplify studying for the students and he has created this uh, very in-depth curriculum i'm told uh, which creates this uh, platform for kids to consume and by seeing the success of that in india uh, there is uh, uh, that launch is happening in the us and maybe other parts of the world so that's something which is another great example of actually you know when you say indian companies going global and all the examples which were mentioned they are like they are behemoths you know these companies have been there for years on end you know they come with lot of uh, uh history and credibility and they've built their empires over years but here you talk an example of a company like byju's which is a startup indian startup who is now uh, trying to go global i think that's a great story as well thank you thank you for sharing that mega Uh, Michael, are you with us? Thank you. I am. Yeah. And uh, your uh, presentation about Tata, Tata Group, and uh, all the history was very illustrious. What I would like to hear from you is, what is in the foray for Tata Group in terms of new technologies which are emerging? Particularly, we are talking about uh, uh, the five G technology, the the clean tech. what is tata doing in those areas <laughs> so you want me to predict the future <laughs> well you know is, is there something in public domain which you can share with us so yeah no i yeah absolutely uh so as you may know our current chairman uh chandra as he is known uh was the former ceo of tata consultancy services which is our big tech uh tech company um and so not surprisingly uh when he became chairman and since then it's over 2 years now he has put a very significant emphasis on digital technology um both as a business so tata digital is something that um that has been announced um but is still kind of in incubation incubation stages but also leveraging digital technologies for our existing companies um that's pretty obvious on how you would do that with uh with a TCS or with a Tata Communications um maybe even uh, obvious for some of the consumer facing brands like the hotel businesses or the retail businesses um but maybe less obvious um in some of the industrial brands like Tata Steel Tata Power um tata motors um but it's uh it's really driving digital technology across every aspect of tata to both um uh streamline efficiencies uh identify new opportunities for growth and at the end of the day make those companies more um more customer friendly uh i mean we we are obviously uh doing this event over a digital technology <laughs> um and um everyone is using them more and more these days because of our um you know our our stay at home and and social distancing and all of that um but it will become increasingly important to understand the technologies understand their applicability to businesses people and societies as we move forward you mentioned 5G with 5G as 5G is rolled out um i mean companies like uh Uber and and Lyft wouldn't exist without 4G uh technology and so who knows what the future is going to hold with 5G 
Um, so that's definitely an area that we're going to be focused on is uh, continuing to um, understand, leverage, develop uh, digital technology. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So, Dr. Jan, I have a question to you. And the question mm -hmm. is, of course, we have, uh, we had discussed this in our prep call. As, uh, to me, as an Indian American who's been uh, living in the U.S. for the last 30 years, there are a few things which really strike at me and probably to most consumers also. And when we are talking about, you know, German technology or we're talking about, you know, French confectionery or wines or Japanese technology or Korean, you know, uh, gadgets, etc. What is brand India? What do you, what is brand India with all the huge, uh, you know, uh, very experienced executives we have here? And uh, I'm, in my mind, I have a question. What is brand India? Is it people? Because, you know, like every time I ask this question to my colleagues and people who are very familiar with India and U.S. scenario. That's not the question for us. That's a question for my common man, American friend. You know, probably some of them who are well-traveled, uh, educated, they will see a sari, they will see a bindi, they will see a food or a chicken uh, tikka masala and samosas and all those things. But that's not brand India. What is brand India for you? Well, it's, it's a difficult question to say. There are so many things uh, one can point to, but I think people would be the one, especially people who have gone abroad. Uh, or gone abroad means come to the United States, especially. Uh, because of the U.S. immigration policy, the kinds of people that they admitted, the 60s and 70s and 80s, they have really stood out. I, I mean, there is an IIT Alumni Association they are not only heading companies, they're not only doing great work, but they're also uh, big philanthropists. Uh, I mean, it's a difficult question to say, to answer. I understand, uh, you I, know, and that's why- I, uh, I have a point to make in- Yes, John. Yes. With Brand India. Uh, of course, country, country brands are a reality. When do you want to flag to fly the national flag to, to market your products internationally? When do you not? But more importantly to me, Brand India was conveyed and defined starting in the 60s and 70s by the IITs and the IIMs of India. They were sort of the sharp spearhead of uh, generations of Indians who were leaders and innovators, uh, whether they stayed in India or made their home elsewhere. I don't think you can dissociate the question from the unique role pay, played by Nehru's IITs and IIMs in producing an elite, for lack of a better word, sure. that yeah. is all in nature, but sure. profoundly and deeply Indian yeah. at the same time. So, uh, I get the uh, same answer from uh, both of you from academia. Let me ask Mega. Mega, what is brand India for you? Outside India, not in India. I think brand India to people living outside of India is um, uh, uh, the myriad of culture and diversity uh, India sort of brings to the table. Uh, and, and I think uh, as somebody did say people, and to me that's, uh, uh, it's, it's a very different, uh, uh, people of course is an important ingredient uh, in every culture. Uh, but I think Indian, uh, what there is a sense of mysticism. There's a sense of uh, uh, mystery. There's a sense of um, jugaad, <laughs> which uh, which the Indians bring to the table as well. There's a sense of spirituality, uh, culture. Uh, I think these are the few aspects which are very true to India, which bring in an, an, an intelligence, you know. So when a combination of all these things, which is, which is, you know, you have an intelligence, you have culture, spirituality, balancing the equation, ability to do the jugaad, you know, find ways to do things, you know, innovation. Uh, this makes it a very con interesting concoction. Uh, to to make a brand India uh, stand out uh, in its own esteem, I would think, and that would be my interpretation. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mega. Uh, Michael, same question to you, sir. 
Yeah, I was, um, uh, I think if I had to put one, uh, put this into kind of a succinct way, uh, I would say today, uh, Brand India is, stands for opportunity. Um, and that could mean anything to anyone, really. Uh, you've got a um, democratic market-based society. Um, and so from a business standpoint, there's opportunity on that front. Um, you've got a um, kind of a, a country that is no longer a developing country, but it's not a fully developed country. So you've got opportunity in that, from that front as well. Um, you've got the strategic opportunity uh, that many look to India as well as a counterbalance to China. Um, and so I think, um, I think India today, uh, the greatest brand um, um, kind of uh, feeling that one can take away is, is a land of opportunity. Uh, let me add something. It's incredible, yeah. India. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, can not I add you. something to this? Yes, sir, please. Uh, one of my professors at the University of Maryland, later my colleague, wrote a book, A Metaphorical Journey Through 23 Countries. So for each country, he found a metaphor. Professor, the metaphor for the U.S. would be football. Uh, for India, he chose the metaphor Nataraja, standing on a single leg, dancing, trying to balance the world. I, I would say that's a nice metaphor. Right, right. That's interesting. Okay, anyway, so, so let me uh, close this question by saying that I'm disagreeing with all of you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the counterpoint, the counterpoint is branding is unique identification of a person or identity is something. So when okay. you say wine, I'm thinking about French wine. When you say car, I'm thinking about German car. When you think about population, I'm thinking about China you know, or India, you know, for that matter. So, you know, and this question is very deep in the sense that all of you mm -hmm. are so exposed to India, including John. And, you know, I have this question in my mind from time to time when I'm traveling with my clients and colleagues from US to India, and I've taken 55 delegations. And, you know, everybody's quite, uh, you know, zapped at the at the at the the sound and the smells and the traffic of India and you know the technology. By that before now, there is a for example in Bangalore now, uh, thanks to some companies, uh, we have a highway to go to uh, Info City or you know. But when there was no highway there, you know, it, it used to take two hours to reach to the tech park. You know, on the south side. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Mega. Thank you, Vinod. I really appreciate your participation and support to make this uh, session great. India Goes Global.